So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background on what MLS does and some of the things we've learned over the last year and a half of being in operation. Um, uh, so I'm Brandon Mason, I'm President and CEO of Mason Lipsey Scientific, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on myself first. And of course that's me. Um, I graduated from WVU in 2006, and then I went to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. From there, I worked at the United States Securities and Exchange Commission for about two years while I was thinking about being a lawyer, and this convinced me not to be a lawyer. Um, from there, I started working with a small business on a subcontract with the Department of Energy, um, specifically with the National Nuclear Security Agency. Uh, and from there, I started working with Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Knoxville, Tennessee. And then from there, I started uh, Mason Lucy Scientific with my partner. So why did I start Mason Lucy Scientific? Well, while I was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, I sat across the hall from my current partner, Jake Lucy. And uh, we annoyed each other back and forth a little bit. He's a physicist, and I was his program manager. So there were issues there, and we ended up being good friends outside of work. And a proposal came up from the Department of Energy, and they needed some new technology to uh, basically help the IEA with uh, some issues that they were having in terms of um, tracking and maintaining certain let's say, shipments and things. So what ended up happening is we wrote a, pro a proposal for this, which is a whole container seal. Um, what's interesting about this is it's a, the fabric itself is a basically a sensor array is what we ended up doing. And this is completely configurable to any size, any shape, um, very low cost. And what we did is we filed a patent for it. And while we were working on the patent, and doing some background research, we realized, oh wait a second, if we hook this up, this can do a lot more than just detect intrusion. So, if you look at this, you can see there's a lot of different sensors here. We've actually been able to make this into about two or three sensors, so it doesn't look like this any longer. This is an early prototype. And from here, this is what you see on a computer screen in real time. And if you go back and forth, you can see where the cuts are. We have cuts here and cuts here. And you can see that those show up in real time. We also found out that not only does this do with the dues with cuts, it also does it with leaks. And that's where we decided all oh, this way, this has a huge commercial application for a lot of different things. So from there, we decided, well, you know, we should start our own company. So that's where Mason Lose Scientific came from. Um, this was not easy when you're working for a national laboratory because Basically, when you work for a national laboratory and sign the paperwork, they own your brain inside and out. Um, so we, I ended up actually getting outside of approval to actually start the company and then try to patent and license the technology back to the company. Um, that took about eight months before we decided we had to leave the laboratory. Um, and what ended up happening was, is we were able to do some other things instead of just the product development. And what we started doing is a nuclear and electrical consultation. Um, like I said, Jake's background is in nuclear and uh, in nuclear physics. Um, we can also do electrical engineering background. Uh, we have that too. Um, we also can do biomedical applications. As you can see with the product, if you just let your mind wander a little bit, there's an awful lot of biomedical applications for that. And we also do project and program management all the way from small projects all the way to managing entire programs, which is what I did at the laboratory and uh, with the Department of Energy prior. Um, one of the interesting things that our license agreement with Oak Ridge National Laboratory ended up doing was they forced us, because we have government contracts right now, to set up a separate co company to license the technology. So what ended up happening is we set up ML Technologies, which is now the licensing agent for Mason Lone State Scientific. From there, we are in the process of obtaining uh, license agreements from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, which, if you look at our patent, um, they actually own the prior art. So the patent that we're licensing from UT Patel, uh, which operates Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and we're also finalizing some deals with Oak Ridge National Laboratory at the moment. Um, 
this one is actually probably going to go through today, which is actually kind of exciting for us because that's, this is a long process. In fact, the licensing process with Oak Ridge has now taken since December of 2011. Um, so we're in the process of getting this. This one took about three months, which has been nice. Um, and some of the things that we've learned, uh, the big one is find a great support system. You can't start a company by yourself any longer. It's, it's nearly impossible. You can't deal with the paperwork, especially if you're doing government contracts. There's so much back-end paperwork, and if you're direct charging 40 hours a week, you just can't do it. Um, and one of the big things is to try to actually use that support system. Uh, in Knoxville, we have something called Tech 2020, which is an incubator that we're a part of. Um, here in Frederick, we're a member of Fitzy. Tech 2020 has a lot more back-end support, um, and they've helped us a lot from the product development standpoint and from the contracting standpoint. They've been able to give us a lot of good advice, putting us in contact with uh, lawyers, CPAs, basically everything that we would need to actually get the company going from a perspective of, I don't know. Uh, so I guess for Jake and I, our background is both with government contracting the private industry doesn't work like that at all. So, <laughs> there was a lot of, there was a big learning curve for us on that. Um, and one of the big things we did learn is make sure that you have a really, really good lawyer. Um, that had, we, he had, our lawyer has saved us about six times in the last 10 months from making serious mistakes um, or stepping, our, stepping on our own toes, especially when it comes to tech transfer and licensing agreements from national laboratories or major corporations. Any, uh, so the, what we ended up doing is the, the, on the advice that we got from Tech 2020 was interview about three to six lawyers, sit down with them. We ended up interviewing three, um, and one of the, we have a kind of a little bit of a Goldilocks story about that. Is the one was you know not, it was a little bit too cold, the other one was a little bit too hot, and we ended up finding one that was right in between. It was great for us. And he writes all of our legal documentation. I'm able to run things past him. Um, and that has helped us out an awful, awful lot. And to, to be honest, one of the things that I didn't plan for when I started the company was how much I was going to be spending the legal fees. Um, uh, and I think that probably is the nature of the work that we're doing, is that we have to have a legal team on hand to deal with Oakers National Laboratories lawyers or Johns Hopkins lawyers or the lawyers for other major government contractors. Um, because being small, also having ideas and trying to patent ideas, you've got to have a really, really tight non-disclosure agreement with people. You've got to have the ability to seek compensation if they steal your ideas. Um, and you've got to be able to give documents and contracts to them to give them to let them give a good idea of what you're doing. Um, this was the other thing that we were really surprised about, is that we were in a cycle of getting everything done really, really fast and going and going and going, and then people would, it would just stop yeah, because you had to wait on somebody else. And one thing you don't realize when you're on the outside of government contracting, or I guess probably just in private business in general, is you can work really, really hard, and then it stops, and you've got to wait on somebody else. And you're not a real big priority to anyone. Uh, only, you're a big priority to yourself, but not to a whole lot of other people. So this one is really hard to get over, and it's still frustrating, um, but it's also just the nature of the work. So what you have to do is you hurry up, and then you wait on somebody else, and do something else to push on those. Um, so that's, in the, that's one of the other lessons that we've learned. Um, this was a big one for Jake and I. Um, know what you do well and know what you don't. Um, Jake is really technically minded and I'm more business minded. So we are, if you put us in a Venn diagram, we mesh really, really well. Um, my background will, can do project and program management, business is highly technical. So for us, coming together, we have a really good overlap. Um, but there are things that I still don't do well. Um, uh, keeping up with accounting, I'm terrible at keeping up with accounting. Uh, so, one of the things that I ended up doing to help supplement this is delegate responsibility and just let it go. You can't micromanage if you're trying to do a million different things. Um, so what we ended up doing is as soon as we possibly could, we ended up hiring a chief operating officer who handles the day-to-day -day aspects of running the business. And for me, that was a real re revelation because I was able to go from uh, 
dealing, working 40 hours a week to direct charging, to also spending 20 hours a week um, doing uh, just the background of the business and keeping things going. So uh, this, this allows me to actually be an entrepreneur, where I wasn't actually able to be an entrepreneur because there was so much that I was doing. So I can sustain the business without delegating responsibility, but as soon as you delegate the responsibility, then you can set focus on, focus on uh, other things and growing your business. Um, finding a balance is really, really hard because before you start a company and if you're working for a major corporation, your day typically ends at 5 o'clock and you're done. Uh, when you own your own company, your day is never over. One of the things that it took me a really long time to get a handle on was a never-ending to-do list. It used to be that I had three to five things that I really need to get done today. Now I've got 50 things that I need to get done this week, next week. So you, one of the things that actually ended up helping me is I carry a notebook with me everywhere. Where if something pops in my head, I write it down. Because otherwise I'll forget about it because something else will come up. You're always putting out fires constantly. There's always a crisis to solve. So it becomes really, really difficult to mesh your work life with your family life because you've got to be able to shut it off. And that's not easy to do because there's always somebody who needs something. There's always a phone call. There's emails come in constantly. So and finding that balance is probably, I would I would say, it's, it's a personal kind of thing. And this took probably, well, eight months. I don't know. going to say you're still working on Yeah. <laughs> But it's not an easy thing to do, and it really takes a really, for, for me, it took a really strong partnership to really be able to communicate and talk really a lot about what your business is doing and when that has to stop during certain er certain times. Um, and I don't think I actually anticipated that when I started the company, how difficult it would be to shut off at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. And the last thing is be prepared to fail constantly. Um, that was the one thing that I wasn't really anticipating. I, uh, it, I'm one of those people who didn't fail a lot up until I got to starting the business, and now I fail once, twice a week on something. Something will die in the water. I have a great idea. It turns out that it's illegal. You know, something like that, um, or is in, is contractually impossible. Uh, but what you learn is that by failing, you learn so much more than what you would if you were successful the first time around. Because you typically, if you're successful, you have really no idea how you got successful with that. It just kind of worked. And when you fail, you realize, oh, you, can do, you can't do all of this, but you can do it that way. So then you go that way. And then it takes you down these different paths. For instance, with this licensing agreement, uh, it has taken us so long, so, so long to get this done. And we have gone through so many different issues with conflict of interest and so many different legal reviews um, and we're just about ready to come down to the home stretch with it and i think from our perspective this has been really really helpful because what it does is it shows us you can fail and just keep moving and you do something else and you're not going to die um, you can come really close to dying but you're not going to die um, so from there i think that's pretty much everything i had to talk about um, and if you have any questions, I'm free to answer those. I just want to make a comment. I think um, the challenges that you found, you know, the lessons learned, mm -hmm. I experienced some of those even just working for a large corporation where I have yeah. a lot of responsibility. As, as, my, as my responsibility and my span of control has increased and I'm now running a fairly large portion of the business, yeah. I have those same challenges. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the work-life balance, the, the right. limit, but you're doing it for your own company, right? Yeah. I'm doing it for somebody else's yeah. company. Um, so, yay for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and those are some, those are really difficult things to get over because you just can't, in a lot of ways, just get a large problem and just keep moving. Sure. Yeah. What percentage of your budget, you said you spend a lot of legal fees, what percentage of your budget do you spend? Um, I have probably spent in the last Ten months easily, I spent over fifteen thousand dollars in legal fees. Mm -hmm. Easily, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, that sounds about right. That sounds about right. And, and you're hiring. I saw on your website yeah. that you're hiring. Yes, we are hiring. Um, we're hiring in a lot of different areas. I mean, our, our main focus is still going to be on. Um, go back here a little bit. We're still focusing on the consulting side of things. 
because that's where the money comes in. Uh, this is a more simple kind of thing, especially when you're providing a service to people. And one of the, our, the real reasons that we can get work like this is that most of the people who work for us are PhDs or highly trained, and we can pay them better, we give them a lot more freedom, and we can charge a whole lot less because we're decentralized. Um, and that cause, that's a really great thing for us because, for instance, I can provide basic services that a national laboratory can provide in terms of someone who's highly technical and highly capable. Um, and most of the time, they don't need you know, 200% overhead or a really nice office or a laboratory space, especially if you're doing this thing broke, go fix it. You know, it's a hard thing to fix, but if I can send somebody out there for you know, $100 an hour less, pay them better and give them more freedom, this is something that we really like to do. And one of the other things we, we really want to focus on as we start hiring people is making sure that these people do have creative freedom. Because that's one thing you lose really quickly when you're in a national laboratory or if you're in a highly technical type of uh, job, is that if I'm paying you for 40 hours of work, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of projects to fill your 40 hours of work if I'm a major corporation. For us, we want to make sure that you have the ability to think and provide new things. One of the things that I learned, I heard really early on when we were starting a company from uh, our mentors was, you know, when as soon as you start, act like you've got $10 million in the bank and you've got a $10 million company. And one of the things that Jake and I talked about, well, you know, we're all technically capable people. Why can't everybody have within the company be capable of having a $10 million company within, within there? So for us, for instance, I fall on the management side. So there's a potential that I could have $10 million in management contracts. Jake is nuclear. We could have $10 million in nuclear contracts. And what we like to try to do is operate in a fashion that gives every employee the capability to have their own $10 million company. And we just provide the framework for them. Because this framework and making that leap into being an entrepreneur is hard. It's extremely hard, um, especially for people that work in national laboratories that still have pensions. Um, one of the things that works well for us is that uh, a lot of the younger national laboratory people that are 35, 38, and under don't really think that there's going to be a pension. So what you do is you we can increase the pay, and then the safety net is still there, but it's not the same kind of safety net. You're not going to fall on a pension, but you probably wouldn't get the pension anyway. I know for a fact at my age, there's no way that I would have gotten a pension at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Mm -hmm. So for us, this is sort of where we want to be. Well, I would imagine this model that you have then the, the national labs and now they can just they can just take what they need they, they don't have to have a full time employee yeah. they can contract with you, get what they need and then move on and that gives them a more flexible model which that's from everything that I read, that's where the market yeah. is trending anyway, large organizations are going to be contracting out a lot more than work yeah. to independents, to small businesses because it allows them to rise and fall with their needs. Exactly, it, well, and that's one of the things that we thought about when we started doing the consulting side and building that side is that these large corporations can't pivot fast. Mm -hmm. If there's an issue, with, if, government, if let's say the president zeroes out your budget, um, you're dead in the water with 30 people. For us, we can pivot and do something else really quickly to another program that's doing the same kind of capability. Mm -hmm. And we have all of that that's just moved. Yep. Um, so from a contractual standpoint, this makes a lot of sense. We're cheaper, uh, especially to the government. That, I mean, that's a huge thing, is we can reduce costs to the government. Um, and a private industry, and they don't have to keep somebody on staff for a really long time. 